excuse me. Sorry, I've had some kidney stone issues lately and they say I need to be more hydrated as I'm trying to drink some more water, so just a second. You know what's funny about water? It's old, like old as the earth itself. Because I mean, we can make water through industrial practices, fuel cells and whatnot, and I'm sure it happens naturally as well, but most of the water that we drink, it's been here from the beginning and it just keeps getting recycled over and over again. It evaporates up into the clouds, condenses, falls to the ground as rain, gets consumed by plants and animals, expelled by plants and animals, and then evaporates back up into the clouds all over again. Every glass of water you drink has an atom in it that once nourished a dinosaur, or was peed out by a king. Hell, there's a non-zero chance that I just consumed an atom that was once inside of one of you. Or myself, when I was a kid. See, we're all connected. By bodily fluids. It is the mucus that binds us. <laughs> now that's interesting enough, but it gets even crazier when you start asking, where did this water come from in the first place? And now we're starting to realize that there's actually many different types of water than the one that we think of as water. And it opens up possibilities that we never even thought of before. You know, one of the funnier things about the movie Waterworld is that it imagines a world where the earth is covered with water. And what's funny about that is that the earth is pretty much covered with water. We live on a water world. The vast majority of life on this planet floats around in the oceans. You and I are the weirdos, in many ways. Let's just start with the numbers. Water covers approximately 71% of the Earth's surface. There are 326 million cubic miles of water on Earth. 97% of the planet's water is found in the oceans, which accounts for 320 million cubic miles. And only 3% of the planet's water is fresh water. In other words, even though you need to drink water to survive and the planet is mostly made of water, 97% of that water would kill you if you drank it. That's irony. In fact, there's an angle that if you approach the Earth from that angle, it looks like the entire planet is pretty much water. It's called the water hemisphere. Like if you were an alien approaching the planet from that direction, you would think that the planet was almost completely made of water. And if you were an alien that was killed by water and you approached this planet and landed there, well, that would be the dumbest plot twist ever. I mean, come on, who would write something like that? Water is such an important part of our lives. It literally makes up who we are. The average human body is 60% water. Our brains are 80% water. Hell, the air we breathe is 4% water, which, how does that work? The aliens come down here and they're breathing this substance that literally burns their skin, but it doesn't do anything to their lungs. Wouldn't that be like breathing mustard gas? That's not what this video is about. The fact is we're finding water in different forms all over the solar system, but the earth is unique for the type of water that we have and the amount of water that we have. So how did it get this way? For the longest time, the leading theory was that the Earth got its water from comets. The thinking was that the Earth formed too close to the sun for it to be able to hold on to its water, so they thought that the Earth formed, cooled, and then that water came from outside. And comets made a good theory because they're known to be made up of ice and dust. That's why you get that big tail as it approaches the sun because it's being boiled off. This fit nicely with the theory of the late heavy bombardment. This was a period of around 3.8 to 3.9 billion years ago where for somewhere between 20 million and 200 million years, the Earth was bombarded by comets, asteroids, and other large objects in space. You could think of it like the solar system cleaning up all the debris and leftovers from its formation. Now there's a lot of evidence that the late heavy bombardment happened, and we do know that you know there's billions of comets out there in the Oort cloud, so it's not too big of a leap to think that in the early solar system, a lot of rogue comets and whatnot could have hit the planet and brought it in that way. Now, of course, the first thought that you might have is that that would take a lot of comets, and you're right, it would have taken billions, maybe trillions of them, which is just insane, but this is the universe we're talking about here. Something being insane has never been a barrier before. But as we study comets closer and have actually sent probes out to them to take samples and analyze them, this theory has come under more scrutiny. Because comets contain ice, yes, but it's a different kind of ice, made from a different kind of water than you find here on Earth. A normal water molecule consists of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. That's, that's high quality H2O. But in the comets we sampled, the hydrogen atoms usually have an extra neutron in the nucleus. This is known as deuterium, so you could call the water on the comets D2O. Another name for this is heavy water, which does exist here on Earth, but in very small quantities. So that might be strike two against the comet theory. A strike three might be the fact that if we got bombarded with comets and that's what brought all of our water here, then you probably see a similar amount of water in other planets as well, which 
we just don't. So the comet theory does still get talked about, but it's kind of hanging on by the skin of its teeth at this point. There is a new theory though that's come around, it has more to do with meteorites. So there are three main groups of meteorites. Iron meteorites that were once part of the core of a planet or an asteroid. The stone group, which is the largest group of meteorites, these were once part of the outer crust of a planet or asteroid. And some contain small grain-like inclusions called chondrules that originated in the solar nebula. Stone meteorites with these chondrules are known as chondrites. And stony irons, these are the least abundant, believed to have formed at the core and mantle boundary of their original planets. And by the way, if you're confused by the difference between asteroids, meteoroids, and meteors, I have been too for most of my life. And it is confusing because they're basically the same thing. So if you're looking up in a telescope and you see a giant rock floating around in space, that's an asteroid. A much smaller rock or piece of debris would be a meteoroid. And if that meteoroid passes through the atmosphere and burns up, that flash of light, that shooting star, that's a meteor. And whatever is left over and hits the ground and gets picked up later, that rock, that's a meteorite. That it suffix connotes that it's a type of rock. The oid suffix is the Greek word for shape or has the characteristics of. So an asteroid has the characteristics of a star. That's the, the aster part of the name. If you had a rock that had the characteristics of a meteor, then you've got a meteoroid. And if you have something that has the characteristics of, say, a blood hemorrhage, well, that's a hemorrhoid. And if you see one of those through a telescope, you're looking at the wrong moon. Anyway, a new theory about how water came to Earth involves instatite chondrite meteorites, or EC for short. ECs got attention because they resemble the material of our planet's building blocks. This theory was just published in August 2020 in the journal Science, and it suggests that instead of all the water being brought here from outside, like say from comets, that it actually came from the very material that made up the Earth in the first place. EC meteorites make up about 2% of collected meteorites, and they have the same level of oxygen, titanium, and calcium isotopes as we find here on Earth. So there's only a few pristine EC meteorites to study, but they looked at the deuterium ratio to see if it's similar to what we find here on Earth or if it's closer to what we see on comets. According to Anne Peslier, a planetary scientist at NASA's Johnson Space Center in an interview with Cosmos Magazine, quote, all planetary materials contain both hydrogen and deuterium. The deuterium-hydrogen ratio is one way of pinpointing where water on Earth comes from. So you'd expect these meteorites to be dry because of how close they were to the sun, but according to the research study, it has a lot more hydrogen in it than they expected. They used two different types of mass spectrometry to, to measure the composition of the meteorites, and what they found was that the DH ratio was very similar to the Earth's mantle. They also found similar nitrogen isotopes, just for good measure. And on top of that, they did a variety of computer simulations of different mixes of chondrite materials in the Earth's formation to kind of see which one produced the most water. And in the end, they determined that, yeah, the right mix of EC materials could have produced the amount of water that we see today. In fact, if the Earth was completely made up of this type of EC material, it would have produced three times as much water as what we have right now, even though the material itself only has up to like 0.54% hydrogen. So that doesn't sound like much, but in the end, two thirds of the Earth could have been made by other types of material and you would still see as much water as what we have today. So yeah, it is possible that the water came from the very rocks that created the Earth itself. And I mentioned nitrogen isotopes earlier. It, it also concluded that this might also explain the large amount of nitrogen in our atmosphere as well. The study doesn't completely give up on the external comet theory altogether, though. Peslier wrote in Science that, quote, instatite chondrite-like material could have been incorporated into Earth after accretion, and that after accretion, it appears that the water was added to its oceans and atmosphere, not its interior, with contributions from comets and carbonaceous chondrite-like material. So the late heavy bombardment theory isn't completely dead. It, it may have still played a part. So the water may have come from inside and from outside. So here's the crazy part about it that frankly, I'm having trouble wrapping my head around. If the water came out of the rocks that formed the planet, that means that it's pervasive throughout the entire planet, including the mantle and the core. In fact, in a paper published in Science Advances in 2017, a team of researchers argued that there may be more water in the mantle of the earth than in all the oceans. To get more specific, there's an upper mantle and a lower mantle, which you can see, right? Upper mantle, lower mantle. See, it's right there on my shirt. Uh, they don't think that there's any water specifically in those areas, but it's the area in between right there that they actually think could be a lot of water. This is called the Mantle Transition Zone, or MTZ, and it's anywhere between 410 and 660 kilometers thick, and it consists mostly of the minerals wadsleyite and ringwoodite, both of which can hold lots of water. 
So they basically did some experiments with synthetic ringwoodite and they measured what's called dislocation mobility, which is sort of a, a measurement of the viscosity of ringwoodite with and without water. And what they found was for the MTZ to fit the known viscosity profile, it would have to be made up of one to 2% water, or as they say in the study, the MTZ should thus be nearly water saturated globally. In other words, there is an ocean of water deep beneath the Earth's crust. And another study earlier this year actually argued that there might be just as much water in the Earth's core. And this gets really weird and complicated because at the pressures and temperatures that you see at the Earth's core, it kind of causes water to bond chemically with, with iron and silicates. Leading the researcher to conclude, quote, the planet's core may act as a larger reservoir that contains most of Earth's water. So it turns out that what we think of as water, the stuff we drink, the stuff we bathe in, the stuff we swim in, it's actually a very narrow definition of what water actually is. It's kind of like what we think of as light is just a narrow band of the electromagnetic spectrum. But that's a good thing because that means that we can find and harness water in a lot more places than we previously thought. Take the recent discovery of water on the moon by NASA's SOFIA telescope. Now we've known for a while that there's probably water ice in the, in the craters around the poles that never get sunlight, but, but water on the surface of the regolith in the sunlit areas, that's a new thing. Previous observations had detected some form of hydrogen, but we couldn't tell if it was water or hydroxyl, which has sort of a similar chemical signature to water. But Sophia's infrared camera picked up a wavelength that's specific to water that's 6.1 microns. And it found it in concentrations of 100 to 412 parts per million. Or in another way of putting it, it would be a 12 ounce bottle of water per cubic meter of regolith. Now that's still pretty dry. That's still like a hundred times drier than what you see in the Sahara Desert, but it gives us a place to start. And it's something that will be looked into further by NASA's Viper mission, which is gonna create water maps on the moon. And then there's a the whole debate about water on Mars. NASA made waves in 2015 when the announcement was made that the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter found what they thought were briny hydrites on the surface of Mars. Basically, it found streaks on sloped areas that seemed to ebb and flow over time and darken during the warm seasons. They called these lines recurring slope linears, or RSL. The researchers suggested that it was probably a subsurface flow with water wicking to the surface. And this is a big deal because that indicates there might be enough water under the surface of Mars to maybe hold life. But since then, the theory has become hotly debated. A 2017 paper argued that those dark streaks may be nothing more than granular sand particles and that there's probably not enough water there to actually support life. According to project scientist Rich Zurich, while the new report suggests that RSL are not wet enough to favor microbial life, it is likely that on-site investigation of these sites will still require special procedures to guard against introducing microbes from Earth, at least until they're definitively characterized. Better to be safe, I guess. But hope, and maybe water, springs eternal. On September 28th of this year, just a couple months ago really, the journal Nature Astronomy published a paper that suggested that there may be a saltwater lake underneath the ice of Mars' South Pole. Actually, they didn't just confirm one lake, they said there might be three more. They used the MARSIS instrument on the Mars Express orbiter to scan under the surface using radio waves and detected areas of high reflectivity that indicates liquid water under the Martian ice. Not all scientists are convinced though. Jack Holt, the planetary scientist at the University of Arizona at Tucson, doesn't think there are lakes. He told the journal Nature, quote, I do not think there are lakes. Right, there you go. His reasoning is that there is not enough heat flow to support having a brine here, even under the ice cap. So as far as Mars goes, the debate continues. But still, if Mars was formed with roughly the same material Earth was, and that instatite chondrite theory holds true, then there's no reason to believe why there might not be plenty of water there as well. In fact, it could be pretty pervasive throughout our solar system. All we have to do is expand our idea of what water can be. But wherever it comes from, I highly recommend drink your water. You don't want kidney stones. <coughs> All right, thanks a lot for watching and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon who are supporting this channel, helping me build a team, forming an awesome community, and just being overall cool, awesome people. Uh, there's some new people who join. I want to murder their names real quick. We got Taya Martin, Tisha Rue, Elena Scott, Jensen Killick McKinnon, Attila Striba, Jim Holmes, Ruslan, Steve Plege, uh, David Manvel, or Manvel, Marco, and John Prabula. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them, get early access to videos, exclusive live streams, and just form an awesome community, join an awesome community, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please do like and share this video if you liked it and if this is your first time here. Google thinks you'll like this video, so you might want to go check that out. Uh, while you're there, check out any of the other videos that are on my channel. And if you enjoy them and you want to see more, I invite you to subscribe. I do come back with videos every Monday. 
T-shirts available at the store at answersofjoe.com slash store. This one I actually got to use to illustrate a point in my video. Uh, it, is, it is educational, so there you go. Uh, there's T-shirts and hoodies, uh, mugs, stickers, all kinds of cool stuff there. They've got real fun, uh, nerdy, clever designs. They make great gifts. We got holidays coming up, so go check it out. It supports the channel and supports a great designer over in Prague. Again, it's answersofjoe.com slash store. Go check it out. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.